I was not looking to be an actor. I was not looking for opportunities. I was not, I had absolutely no interest at all in being an actor. I was a dishwasher. I was, at that point, content to be a dishwasher because I felt and understood and embraced the fact that I did not have the wherewithal to do much else. Uh, that I wanted to do more, not only did I want to do more, I was preparing myself to do more. One of the preparations I, I decided was essential to my survival was I had to learn to read. I really had to learn to read. I could read third grade level, fourth grade level. As I told you, I left school at the age of 12 and a half. I then decided that I have to learn to read well. And I went about that process. And just that I knew was my goal. The reason was, I realized that in, in New York there were many streets. Some were numbered, but not all. Some were named. And three syllables, I had great problems with pronouncing three syllables. Uh, and every word that had three, four syllables in it, I, it staggered me. I mean, it just, just defeated me. So I decided that I had to learn to read better because all of the information necessary for my survival uh, came to me, would come to me in words. And if I don't understand the words, I wouldn't know the message. And if I don't know the message, I will, no one would have time for me. So that's what I did. I, I tried to learn to read. But anyway, the, the acting came ap totally as an accident. I was looking for a dishwashing job, and I could find a dishwashing job in a paper. It's an African-American paper called the Amsterdam News. And I would go to the want ad pages there, and it would list porters wanted, dishwashers wanted, maids wanted, whatever. And on this particular day, when I needed a job, and I looked into this paper, I, there was nothing there concerning dishwashing. So what I did was... I was about to fold it up and put it into the street bin, you know, the trash bin in, on the streets. And something caught my eye. And what caught my eye was a phrase. It said, actors want it. Well, on, on the want ad page, it said dishwashers want it, and this want it, and, da -da, and porters want it. And I figured, well, I, I can even manage some of those jobs, but what is this actor's job? That doesn't sound like it's too bad. So, and, and, and they're inviting me because they say actors want it. So I decided, and there was an address there in, in the article. So I, uh, I went and I was just 10 blocks away. So I walked over to this place and I went in and uh, no, I walked in, knocked on the door, and a guy came through the door, opened it. It was the basement of a library. I didn't know that at the point. And a guy opened the door. He's a massive, massive guy. I mean, huge guy. Big and, you know. And he said, to, uh, he said yes. I said, I, uh, I came to see about uh, Actors Wanted. He said, you're an actor? I said, <laughs> I said yeah. He said, he said, come on in. I went in, and he said, where have you acted before? I said, Florida. And he said, uh, yeah. He said, you acted in Florida. I said, yeah. Anyway, he said, uh, OK, here is this script. Turn to page 28. Read this scene. It's a page and a half. Go over it a couple of times, and then let me know when you're ready, and uh, we'll read it together. I'll read the other part, and you'll read John. I said, OK. And I looked over it. I could hardly make out what it seemed. Anyway, he says, you ready? I said, yeah. And I stepped up on a little stage, but so big, it was maybe 12 feet, 15 feet wide, and nine feet deep or something, you know. And he said, you ready? I said, yes. He says, uh, OK. Remember, now you're on page 30, 28. I said, yeah. He said, okay, you, you, you. <laughs> he said, you start. I said, okay. 
I started the line, my line. And now I'm reading like I read when I was in school. I am very slow and I am very particular in trying to pronounce these three-syllable words and four-syllable words. As a result, I'm saying, when are you going to be at... Well, he came up on the stage and he snatched that book out of my hand and he said, he spun me around. He grabbed me here and here. And he's marching me to the door. And he's saying, he's saying, get out of here and stop wasting people's time. He said, you can't read, you can't, you can hardly talk. I had this accent, you know. And he says, why don't you just go out? And he's marching me to the door. He's got my collar back here and my belt back here. And he is just, and he's really pissed. He's marching me to the door and he said, he said, just get out of here and stop wasting people's time. He opened the door, pushed me out, <laughs> slammed the door. He said, well, why don't you go out and get yourself a job as a dishwasher? He said. Now, I'm walking down the street to go get a bus, go down uh, Manhattan toward the end, actually, where there were loads of empl uh, employment agencies. And I suspected I would be able to get a job because I'd gotten them there before. Halfway in the block between Lenox Avenue and 7th Avenue. And 7th Avenue is where I'll catch a, a bus or get the subway. I stop dead in the middle of the street between the two. And I said to myself, how did he know that I was a dishwasher? He suspected. I said, I didn't tell him. I didn't say anything about dishwashing. That was a, one thing I wouldn't have told him. And I realized then and there that what he said was his perception of my worth. He perceived me to be of no value beyond something that I could do with my hand. And while he was correct in his anger to characterize me that way, I was offended. I was offended deeply, and I said to myself, I have to rectify that. I have to show him that he was wrong about me. I decided then and there that I was like, this is a wild decision I made, of course, but I did decide then, at that moment, on that street, that I am going to be an actor just to show him that he was wrong about me. And then I would give up the acting because I have, I'm not, what do I want to be an actor for? I committed myself to that. That goes to show you that I was a rather peculiar kid. <laughs> Luckily, I wasn't around psychiatrists and all that kind of stuff because they probably would have marked me as a guy who was a little off his rocker. He told me, among the things he said to me, he said, you can't talk, you can't speak, you can't read. No one ever said that to me before. And I always dreaded it, that someone would say that to me because I really couldn't read well, and I really didn't speak terrifically. Certainly, my accent was Caribbean. So his complaints were dead on.
But I had to now not push that aside. I had to then look at it and say, wait a minute. That's the me that he sees. Therefore, I have to assume the responsibility for either remaining that way or changing it. And, and, and to change it for what purpose? Uh, I have to change it because I felt in myself that if I don't change it, I, I would be less the person that I perceive myself to be. I continued working as a dishwasher, and I, I learned that there were no other theatrical groups in Harlem at that time of the same caliber as was the American Negro Theater. And I decided that uh, I wanted to, and oh, I knew, I learned that they had a school system where they taught acting and stuff and stuff. So I wanted to get in there. I also learned that there were some very uh, prestigious uh, black actors and actresses who were affiliated with this. So I set my sights there. And I learned that they had auditions every three, six months or so. So I decided that I would go there and take an audition. And uh, I went in and asked if I could come in for an audition. I didn't see this huge, massive guy there, uh, fearful that he would remember me and, and, and discount me. But I went there, and they told me, yeah, you, you can come and have an audition at such and such a time. You know. Well, I did, but I didn't know where I would get a scene from. I didn't know that there were places you can go and buy a little books of plays and you can take a scene and study that and then show it use it as an audition so what I did was I bought a true confessions magazine true confessions magazines were for ladies but listen I all I needed was to uh, so I selected the two paragraphs out of a, such a story I memorized it best I could and I was going to use it as thing. The words that I didn't quite understand, I would learn about them. I would ask certain people that I got to know. So I understood what the words were. Mind you, my accent is still pretty poor. Long story short, I, I went in and I auditioned for them, and they said, thank you. They said, we'll let you know, and they <clears throat> did indeed let me know, and the note came that I wasn't Selected. I was crestfallen, so I couldn't give it up. So I went back to them. I walked in, and there was a lady at the kind of like the desk. And I said, I took an audition the other day, and, and uh, uh, I wasn't accepted. I said, however, I, I, I'm here today to ask if this is a possibility. And she said, what? I said... Uh, I noticed that you don't have a janitor. And I said, I will do the janitor work for you because it's not a big deal. You know, you have a fairly small place here and stuff. I will do the janitor work for you in exchange for letting me study here. And she looked at me in a peculiar way. She said, you would do that? I said, yes, I would do that. And she said, well, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to them about it. I went back. I said, I'll come back in a couple of days. I went back in a couple of three days. And I could tell that she didn't really tell them. I said, uh, um, she said, oh, yeah, yeah. She said, well, she said, excuse me a minute. She goes into the back with uh, in the office, I suppose. And then she comes, she stays there a while, and she comes out with a guy, and she, she says, what is, what is this you uh, do? He didn't know me from the other thing. This is, you know, this, I'm just, he's seeing me for the first time. And uh, I said, yes. He said, uh, you, would, you, you would do that? I said, yes, I would do that. He said, why would you do that? I said, because I want to learn. I want to learn. And he said, I see. He says, where are you from? And I told him, any experience? No. 
Well, they let me in. They let me in, and I started studying. Then they kicked me out because I wasn't didn't show much prop, uh, possibilities. And, and then they, uh, I was rescued by my fellow students in the, in the classes that I was in because they got to like me. They thought I was a little crazy guy, but they got to like me. And when they told me, when the authorities said to me that uh, you won't be coming back, because you didn't show any possibilities. My friends, on their own accord, not mine, I had nothing to do with it, but they kind of liked me. And a committee of them, like three of them, went to see the head person. And they said that we understand that Sydney is not going to be coming back, and uh, so and so and so. We just wondered, we know that you're going to be doing a student production. And we figure that since he worked so hard to, to try to be uh, acceptable, uh, we wondered if maybe you could give him a walk on. Maybe you can just walk across the stage once. And the person said, well, I'll, and, and she, it was a she, said to the friends in my class, because she recognized that they were doing it out of, of kind of, they had developed some kind of feeling for me. And she said, I'll think about it. And when they went back to her, she said, well, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll make him an, uh, an understudy for someone. And uh, she said to me, so she said to me, I'll let you understudy the guy who's going to play the part. Now, she had no intentions of me ever, ever playing that part. So I, I took it. I didn't know she had no intentions. I just learned that later. The guy that she had chosen to write to do the part was Harry Belafonte, a very handsome, well-known, good actor. Anyway, long story short, I studied that part. And I was on top of it, as best I could have been. The evening of the performance, Harry Belafonte unfortunately could not come because it was uh, his father was the janitor at a building, and he had to help his dad take the ashes from the furnace that heated the place. There were 8, 10, 12 big, big uh, uh, baskets of ashes, had to be taken up for the dump trucks to take away. And he had to do it on that particular evening. So she was stuck with me, and she set me on. I went on. I played the part. I knew all the words. I had, I was, I had my accent, you know, and, I, and I, I did the best I could. There was a guy in the audience who had directed that play before and had been an, invited by the lady who, was, who directed it, us at the theater, and she had asked him to come and take a look at it to see what she had done with it. And the guy came. But as a, she, he came on a night when Harry Belafonte, the star, wasn't going to be there. So she put me on. Liz Strader was my first job on Broadway. Very, very first job on Broadway. That guy, that same guy who came and looked, uh, he was doing, he said to me, he said, would you come to my office on Monday? And he says, I'm doing a, uh, a play called Lysistrata. Actually, it was, yeah, a Greek comedy it was. And I went, and he had me read, and he offered me a job, my first job. First, first job, professionally. I was petrified. I was petrified. I knew there were 1,200 people out in the audience waiting for me to walk out on that stage. And I only had a very small part, and I was in the very beginning of the, of the, of the evening. And uh, on my way to the, to the stage, they said, uh, places, which means everybody get in ready, curtain's going to go up. But I had seen everybody in the play, not, not most of the guys in the play, 
going to a little peephole and looking out in the direction of the audience. And I was so interested in what they were looking at. I went and I took a look and I saw 1,200 people sitting, looking at the stage, which the curtain hasn't gone up. And I got so petrified. Then the curtain went up. And the play opened with me running out on the stage and saying, so and so and so and so and so and so and so. And they asked me, well, what are we going to do? And I say, blah, 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 blah. I got out there and I couldn't remember one word. I got a very good review because I, <laughs> I got a, no, I got several splendid reviews because I got out there and I mixed up the dialogue. I was so frightened, I was so petrified that my, I, was too, I started it, but instead of starting with my first line, I started with my seventh or eighth line. And the guy who was supposed to answer me, his eyes went boing, and he said, uh, uh, and he takes his line, goes back, and pulls up the response to this line, and it got all, but the audience is laughing because they don't, those who didn't know the play thought that that was the play. And uh, they, well, I messed up the scene. But they, the, the other actors, because I didn't come back on the stage anymore, after I would have walked off, the other actors kind of righted the boat for them and, and the play went on. Well, the critics said, Several of them said, who was this kid who walked out there and opened this play? He was, he was full of humor and so and so and so and so and so. Truth is, I left the theater after I came off saying to myself, that's it. I tried. I am not going to be an actor. I don't have the gift. And it's, it's silly for me to be. This, okay, I did it, I've stuck to it, and I don't have it. So I left, and I went walking about in New York City. And uh, on my way home, about 11.30, 12 o'clock that night, I'm on my way to my room, where I had the, my residence, hired room from somebody who owned it. Uh, I decided to pick up the newspapers, and I picked up, I guess the Daily News, and there were, believe it or not, there were 13 major newspapers in New York City at that time. Anyway, in three or four of them, I was mentioned very favorably. Well, my dear, being, well, being, 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 I changed my mind. I wasn't going to quit the business so quickly. <laughs> the last performance because the show closed in three days. It didn't get good reviews for itself. A Broadway producer who had on Broadway at that moment a show called Anna Lucasta, he came to see the show that night, the last night. He came backstage and he said to me, he said, let me ask you a question. Now, by the way, I'm, I'm reading my lines better because he said, uh, I have a show called Anna Lucasta and... Uh, I'm sending out a road company. See, he said, I wonder if you'd like to work for me and be an understudy. And I said, yes, I would like that. And he hired me, and I, that was my start. I, I played Anna Lucasta on and off for years and years and years. It was a bump here and a bump there and difficult times in between. Well, anyway, Marty Baum, this guy who didn't know me, but he had heard of me, and he asked me to come to his office the ages, and he sent me next door to a hotel that his office was adjacent to, and uh, he said that th these guys are doing this movie. It's a movie about a place, a place called Phoenix City, and um, it's a good part, and so on, so on. He, he, I, he said, would you want to go? I said, yes, and he sent me over. And I went over, and there was the director and a writer there, and a producer. And uh, they explained to me what the thing was, and they gave me a small scene out of, but they didn't give me the, the book. They gave me the small scene 
and said that, uh, would you read this for us? And I said, yes, and I read it for them, and they liked it. And they said, okay, he said, uh, we'll talk to your agent. And they said, uh, here, take the script with you and read it when you get home. So I go back to Marty Baum, my, the, the guy, who, the agent who sat me there, and he said, uh, I told him what had happened, and he said, well, go on, take it with you, and you read it, and you'll come back. He, he said he feels that they want me to do it. He said, and, uh, let me know what you think about the script. I said, fine. I went home, I read it, and I hated it. I really hated it. It was a story in which there was a janitor. I have no, and had then, no objections to playing a janitor. But this guy in this movie worked for a gambling casino. He was a janitor. As a janitor in this gambling casino, a murder takes place, and the, the bad guys were concerned about me, the character, because they didn't, if, if I had seen anything, that would be trouble for them. So what they did to seal my lips, I had a child, as the character had a child, a little girl. They killed the girl and threw her body on the lawn of his house. And I'm playing this guy. And I, I went to Marty, the, uh, and I said, Marty Bond, the agent, who put me onto it. I said, I read the script, and I can't play it. And he said, why can't you play it? I said, I can't play it because this is a father, and he has a child. And these guys kill her child to intimidate him. And the script permits that intimidation. So the writers feel that that's just for them a plot line. You know, it's not important to them. And I said to him, I said, I can't play that because I have a father. And I know that my father would never be like that. He would never, under any circumstances, be like that. I said, as a father, I would never be able to not attack those guys. Do something to, to show how I am, to articulate me as a human being. And he says, that's why, that's why you don't want to do it. I say, that's why I want to do it. He says, you need money. And I did. My second daughter was about to be born. And I needed the money. I really needed And the money was $750 for playing this part, which was a lot of bucks. Anyway, I couldn't do it. Now, that speaks of who I was. It still speaks who I was, and it speaks of who I am. But who I am is my father's son. That's who I am. And I spent, I spent my life with him until I left him at the age of 15. And I, I've seen him behave with my mother and their siblings and, and uh, their children. And I've seen him with my mother, how he treats her. I grew up on that. I know how to be a decent human being. So uh, I couldn't play it, and I didn't play it. I left Marty's office, and I went to 57th Street, yes, 57th Street, and, and Broadway. There was a loan office there called Something Something finance, that you could go in and borrow money on your furniture, on your car, or whatever. I needed $75 to pay Beth Israel Hospital for my, the birth of my child. 
And I had to put up my furniture such as it was. And they loaned me that money. And I, I paid for Beth Israel Hospital and my baby was born. Some months later, uh, Martin Bond, the agent, called me up and he said, uh, what are you doing? I said, I'm working in this restaurant. He said, what do you do? I said, I'm washing dishes. But I had a little bit of an investment. And he said, could you come down and talk to me? For, I want to ask you a couple of questions. I said, sure. I went down. I walked in. He's there alone. I sat down with him. And he said, I have never been able to understand why you turned down that job. It was $700. Eventually, I would tell him why. And he, I don't know whether he understood it or not. But I think before I told him, he said to me, I have decided that anyone as crazy as you are, he says, I want to be their agent. And he remained your agent for how long? Till now, as we sit here. Yeah. Lloyd Richards was the director of Raisin in the Sun. And uh, he was more than a director. He was a theater master, master of theater. African-American, extremely gifted. He and a man named Paul Mann, they were teachers. They had a, t a teaching, a drama school, actually. And after I did a picture called Blackboard Jungle, uh, he asked me, no, after the picture Blackboard Jungle, um, I went to see them because I knew I wasn't working at the level I should be working at. It was a successful film, and I did fairly well, but I wasn't, I wasn't, it, the, the part was not fulfilled as much as I could have fulfilled it. So I went there, and I, I asked them if I could come and take some classes, and they said yes, they invited me in, and I stayed there for a, a very long time. And they taught me, I learned so much. They taught me, but I learned from them that behind words are meanings. Every word has a meaning, and its meaning might very well simply be used as a connection, is, as, was, then, now, last, first. There's a meaning. Now, if we don't express, when we put words together, if we don't express what the meaning is behind this particular bunch of words as actors, if we cannot articulate what is behind this bunch of words, which would be maybe just one paragraph. Behind it may be one point of view, or it may be a combination of points of views. The audience hearing these would expect to see them exemplified in the behavior of the actor. And they taught me how to do that. It was, a, it was a wonderful experience for me because it was produced and directed by a great filmmaker named Stanley Kramer. And I had a chance to work with Tony Curtis. and We got along wonderfully well. The, 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 the only thing that is really outstanding is that it was a, a production of, of Stanley Kramer. It was one of Hollywood's most liberal, most... Uh, courageous uh, men in the in the business, particularly doing a delicate time in America. Uh, working for him was pleasure. was a was a, a total pleasure.
I love the role. It was, uh, it was pretty much how I am. And what it meant to me to receive the award for it, uh, I think it meant a great deal to me. It was the first time for an African-American. Um, I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed the experience because what he was doing, the character, mind you, what he was doing was exhibiting a vast sense of, of himself and the wonders of being alive and the wonders of being a human being and the responsibilities of a human being. And here he is vortexing with some of the most lovable characters. It, it was, and for that, I got an, an award. I embraced the award. Uh, uh, it was... It was wonderful. Th that movie, the, the man who wanted so badly to make that movie did in fact direct it. I've, I've, I've made movies for him in, in my career uh, several times, three times as a matter of fact. Ralph Nelson was a very, very, very humane person. He hired me for three fantastic roles. I will always be indebted to Ralph Nelson because he was, he was a real humanitarian, this guy. The producers were all white. Uh, I was the one of the principal players in the in the, the movie i know what my values were my values are not disconnected from the values some of the values of the black community african american community so i go in front of a camera with a responsibility to be at least respectful of certain values. For this guy, who was a very wealthy, very well-positioned person in this community in, in the South, and I am a, de a detective out of Philadelphia who is, uh, I'm not in the South, I'm on my way home after having visited my, mo my mother. Anyway, he slaps me for, and when I read the script, I said to uh, the producers and the, the director, I said, actually the producers first, who happens to be a very close friend of mine. Walter Muir. Yeah. Uh, I said, Walter, I can't play this. The scene required me to stand there. This guy walks over to me and he slaps me in the face. And I look at him fiercely and walk away. And I said to Walter, you, I said, you can't do that. I said, let me tell you a little bit about America and the texture of American culture as it stands. I said, that is dumb. It is not very bright. I said, we're in the 60s. This is 1968 or You can't do that. I said, the black community will look at that and say, that is egregious. It's, you can't do that. Because the human responses that would be natural in that circumstances we are suppressing them to serve values of greed on the part of Hollywood, acquiescence on the part of people uh, culturally who would accept that as the proper approach. I said, you can't do it. I said, you certainly won't do it with me. And I got, I, you know, I talked to him about it. I said, therefore, if you want me to do this, not only will I not do it, but I will insist 
that I respond to this man precisely as a human being would ordinarily respond to this man. And he pops me, and I'll pop him right back. And I said, if you want me to play it, you will put that in writing. And in writing, you will also say that if this picture plays the South, that that scene is never, ever removed. And Walter, being the kind of guy that he was, he said, yeah, he says, I, I, I promise you that, and I'll give it to you in writing. I ultimately didn't take it in writing. I just took a handshake, because he's the kind of a guy, his handshake and his signature is one and the same. And um, that made the movie. Without it, the movie would not have done as well as it did. My birth was quite unusual in that uh, I was premature and uh, I wasn't expected to live. I was delivered by a midwife in Miami, Florida, in the African American section uh, of that city, and uh, there were no available hospitals for for people of uh, African descent. And so uh, certainly my mother knew, didn't know of one. And uh, so I was born in a small house that was not ours. It was a house that my parents would live in because my parents were not Americans. My parents were Bahamians, which is a group of islands off the coast of Florida uh, m many, many, many islands. They, they run into the hundreds. Some of them are just that big, but, but many of them were large enough for, for uh, populations to, to gather. And <clears throat> my parents were tomato farmers. They farmed tomatoes, and they sold their tomatoes in Miami, Florida. They went two, sometimes three times per year. They would harvest and uh, they, they had to harvest at a given time because there were no motorboats that would take their stuff across, so they had to go by sailboat. So they, 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 re they reaped the harvest prematurely. They had to in order for it to ripen on the way so that when they got to Florida, they would have the fruit would be ready for, for sale. And uh, <clears throat> on one such trip, my mother was pregnant by some six, seven months. They had no expectations that I would be born in, in Florida. Um, but uh, how water broke, that's a phrase, I guess, that you would understand. The water broke, meaning that, of course, something happened in her internal structure that the baby was going to come, whether it was nine months or not. So it was, uh, so it was that I, I was born in Florida uh, uh, unexpectedly. And I, they had to keep me there uh, for some three months because I was so uh, underprepared for birth that uh, it took three months for me to uh, hit a point at which they could take me on a sailboat, which would take several days, back to the Bahamas and their, their tomato field. But during the period when I was really, really close to not being here. Uh, everyone gave up on me. The, 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 uh, the midwife gave up on me. My father also gave up on me because they had had many children. I was the last of the lot. And my dad felt that having experienced births uh, before in, in his family, he had no confidence in my surviving because what appeared to him was that this child was too fragile to, to survive. And uh, my mother had a different point of view. My mother would not accept that. She did not accept it. As a matter of fact, the evening I was born, the very next morning, everyone 
present, that meaning the local people who were friendly with my parents and people who were not, uh, they saw the child, me, and they said, no, no chance. My mother had a different point of view. He left the house uh, the following morning and he went for a stroll. And that stroll ended up at the local undertaker's parlor in a discussion centered around preparations for my burial. And uh, he came back to the house with this little shoebox. It was, in fact, a shoebox. And he came into the house with it. And my mother, who was naturally prone in bed, she was so outraged that she got up and she dressed herself against there. The, uh, uh, everyone gathered there. And she left the house. She went out into the world, I suppose, figuratively speaking. And she stayed for support because she had, she did not want to give up on me. And she was determined not to. Anyway, long story short, she went out and she spent the whole day, I suppose, going to local churches and going to various, wherever she could find, uh, she would find help, she would go, and she did. But the day ended and there was nothing, so she's on her way home. And she decided to stop in and visit a soothsayer. You know what they are. They are fortune tellers in a peculiar sort of way. And uh, she stopped in and she said to this a lady who was there, she said that uh, I just gave birth to a son. And, uh, and she explained what the circumstances were and stuff like that. And she said, I want you to tell me about my son. And they sat down, and this lady began. First, she went into, I hate to say it, but this was a, a, the way I get the story. She went into a kind of, she closed her eyes, and the soothsayer closed her eyes, and she began to talk. In strange, in a strange language, no language at all. I guess was gibberish to anyone listening. Uh, but my mother was hearing her, and then it, it, suddenly the Sutsi's eyes flew open, and she looked at my mother, and she said, "Don't worry about your son. He will survive." And he will not be a sickly child. You must not worry about that child. My mother came back to the house. Cost her 50 cents. In those days, that was a lot of bucks. She went back to the house, and she told my dad to remove the shoebox from the house. There will be no need for it, she said. She told my mother that uh, that I would travel to all the corners of of the earth. I will walk with kings. I will be rich and famous. I don't know about that, but uh, she said so. And uh, everything that she said to my mom. It's amazing. Everything came true. I have never, to this point in my life, and I'm 82 years old, come uh, next, come this Friday, I could never find, because I have a sense of practicality, you know, and I 
I believe in logic and reason, things that I, two tools that I can apply to a circumstance that I don't quite understand, and I can somehow figure it out using those two uh, elements. But I could really never figure it out. I have not to this day figured it out. And uh, it's not that I am stubborn. I am in some areas of my life, but uh, it wasn't that I was stubborn, but I just felt there was something about that circumstance that if I look at it a certain way, or if I apply logically and then put into it all kinds of other elements, like my mother's faith, for instance, and all kinds of other things, then I could come to a point where I could at least accept it as a part of, of the unfolding of this life of mine. So uh, I've spent my life not looking for answers, but trying to understand it. Not in terms of its component elements, the whole occurrence, but in terms of those forces that I have grown to respect, those forces in nature that have influences on our lives. They are referred to uh, by many people, uh, they're referred to as they perceive it. And many people perceive it as strange, unusual, miraculous, in all kinds of ways. Me? I still don't have a fix on it. But I do believe that there are forces in nature that we don't understand, and probably never will, that have influences on our lives that defies uh, understanding. And we didn't have any electricity, we had no, no roads. We had roads, but they were pathways in a way. Uh, there was, uh, we had very little. I mean, we had to, we ate from the sea, food from the sea, and, uh, and what they grew uh, in their su the subsistence farming in a particular way. Their main crop had to be tomatoes because that's how they made their living, and that's what, and that, that money was spent in Florida, some of it, some of it in the capital, on the capital island, which was Nassau. And, uh, and they would bring certain hard groceries with them from, mostly from uh, Nassau. And hard groceries, I mean canned goods. There would be canned milk that would be shipped into uh, the Bahamas from England. And uh, there would be salt pork and salt beef and lard. We ate a lot of lard. There was no such thing as olive oil and, and all the good stuff, you know. Uh, <clears throat> we used uh, lard to cook with. <clears throat> and we ate from the land and the sea. I didn't see a car until I was uh, ten and a half years old. And when I did see a car, <laughs> when I did see a car, whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, I was on the, on the boat with my mother, a sailboat. Uh, uh, going into Nassau Harbor. This is the first time I'm leaving the uh, Cat Island, which is where we lived and stuff, because the tomato fields went kaplut because my parents huh, the state of Florida was in was encouraged, that's the proper word, I think, was encouraged by tomato farmers in Florida to stop importing tomatoes from the Bahamas, and I suspect from other areas in the Caribbean. And it, hap it fell like that. Whoever, whatever body was making the, 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 the 
determination. And my father's business just went, Phew. there was no place else to sell the tomatoes, and that's all he'd ever done in his adult life. So he had to go to take the family to Nassau, which was a tourist island, and he would have to try find a way to support his family by working there, doing whatever he could find, because he didn't have very much money. He barely had enough to move the family to Nassau, where he would sort of look for a job. And uh, that's, that's where we went. I'm coming in on a boat, and I'm just, just wild-eyed about, I see the island coming up, and there's nothing, it looks like a regular island, you know, but it's the first island I'm seeing other than the one I grew up on. So I'm looking at this place, and then I saw what appeared to me to be a beetle, but it was massive. It was huge, and I was, I was fascinated looking at this thing. We are still quite a distance from Nassau, but there, there were obviously these beetle things. And I said to my mother, I said, what's that? And she said, that's a car, because she had seen them in Miami and in Nassau before. And I said, a car? And I said, what, what is that? What does that do? And she tried her best to explain it to me. Until, of course, we got to the docks and I got off and I saw this thing up close, you know, and I was fascinated. I wondered, how, how does it move? How does it get, how does, what is making it move? And it was just amazing. But so were so many other things amazing for me um, for, a, for a long time on Nassau because there were windows. There were paved roads. Never seen a paved road. There were windows along the streets on the main thoroughfare, which was near the docks. And there was, a, there was glass. But you, it was glass you could look through, like you can look through glass, a glass bottle. And there were many things in the window. There were goods and stuff in, in the window. And I couldn't understand it. I didn't know what glass was. If I hadn't seen me. In America, of course not. There were no such things up on on Cat Island. I uh, anyway, um, I decided that I was going to see myself in America. I had seen myself in in the pond reflection because my mother used to go to wash her clothing and uh, the rest of the family's clothing to a pond in the woods. Let's call it the forest, but it wasn't really a forest because the trees were never that tall. But they were six, seven, eight feet tall, and much taller than I was. And I would go with her, she would take me with her, when she did her laundry. And she would go and she would take the clothing and she would, she would add a little octagon soap to a, to a garment, and then she would beat the garment on a stone. That would get the dirt out of it, you know. That's how she did her washing. But I didn't see myself in a pond, because you can't see yourself in a pond. Uh, she's, she's, wa she's washing her clothing in the pond. What every movement with the water, whatever, wherever she touches it, it, it ripples. If the wind is ever so slight, there's a ripple and you can't make out anything. So I didn't know what a shadow was. You ready for this? I saw my own shadow, and I didn't understand it. Mind you, I'm a kid, I'm a little, little kid. Eventually my shadow became my best friend because it imitated me. Every time I do that, every time I do that, you, I could see my shadow doing the same thing. So my shadow became my friend. I used to race my shadow down the beaches. And depending on where the sun was, I would win sometimes, and my shadow would win sometimes. Oh my God. On Cat Island, there was a schoolhouse. 
Uh, the schoolhouse was a multiple, meaning that there was one room. And the children, I don't think there were more than grade one, two, three, maybe four. And uh, I went on some days. Other days I went to the farm. I was going to the farm to work at five years old. Not every day. Certain days I went to the farm. When there they were available days for the school, I went to the schoolhouse. When I saw my first movie. We had moved to Nassau by then. And we left Cat Island when I was ten and a half. So when, as soon as we got to Nassau, Nassau was like a kid coming out of the center of the United States from the smallest, tiniest farming area and suddenly is put into New York City. That's the kind of impact uh, uh, I experienced going into this whole new culture in, the bar, in, in Nassau. And I made some friends quite quickly because right there in a place where my folks were able to, to, to rent a small house, uh, again, with no electricity and no running water and all that stuff, Anyway, this little house had to accommodate us all. And there were five boys and two girls in the family. And I don't think that all of them, I think the elder of the, of the group had already separated and out on their own when we got to Nassau so they could start working and, make a, and assuming their responsibilities for themselves over and above the farm that we were in. But anyway. Um, I met these new kids who were in this particular neighborhood, and they sort of embraced me. And uh, they said to me, uh, oh, I guess some weeks after we, were, we had moved, they, they said that they were going to a matinee. Would I like to come? And, uh, and I didn't want them to know. I didn't know what the word matinee meant. So I said, okay, sure, all right, you know. Uh, I want to be one of a group. So they went to this theater. And this place had a facade. They had pictures of people, white people, on the outside of the thing, uh, which ultimately I came to understand were the advertisement, letting the audience know what the movie is about. But I didn't know... I was going to see a movie. I had no idea. So they bought a ticket for me, and we went in, and we sat. And in, in this place, there were many seats. And there were, well, the whole place was seats. And we took a row there, and uh, we're sitting there. And I am making sure that I, I don't slip up and ask the wrong question or something, uh, because I, I knew that I would make a fool of myself. So I just behaved as best I could as one of the guys, you see. Anyway, the lights go down, and a curtain, big curtain thing opened up, and there was this big white frame. And suddenly, out of nowhere, came letters, big letters, words, on this big white screen. I can barely read. I, I really am not really a reader. I, am, I read terribly. So I couldn't make out really what the words were saying, except some of them were names, and you assume that they were names. So I just kind of waited to see what's going to happen with this lit up screen. I didn't know there was a word name the call screen, but then I saw people, and it shocked me. How did they get there? Then I saw cows, and I saw uh, wagons, and I saw brown people wearing skins and feathers. I had no idea. I would learn later that there were Indians and there were white people, settlers in, in, in certain parts of it. That was my first movie. Uh, 
I was 12 and a half. I was tall. I, I figured I could get a job because it was really wearing my dad out. You know. So I quit school and, and went to work. First, I went to work as a, uh, a water boy working on construction thing. I would go around with a dipper and a bucket. And these guys were all working in the sun, you know. And that part of the world, the sun is fierce. So I walked up and down the line where these guys were working, and I have this bucket and this dipper, and they would take a drink, and so, and that was my job. But it didn't pay very much. And my folks really were in need, so I decided that I was tall enough to hike my age and maybe get a job as an adult. And the guy that I went to, he was like foreman or assistant to the foreman. He knew of my family. And I suspect he chose to make an exception. And he said, OK, because he knew what, it, what was going on. And he moved, he gave me a pick and a shovel. And I was among the big guys. And I was using a pickaxe and shoveling dirt up out of this ditch, up onto uh, the ridge and up above it. And because I got, the pay was much, much better. In the aggregate, or rather the difference, was such that it was very helpful. To, for food and all that stuff. Uh, I was making today's equivalent of maybe uh, $2, $3 a week. But in those days, the $3 went quite a ways. Uh, <clears throat> I, I stayed at that job, and then I worked as a delivery boy, and then I worked in a warehouse where I had to stack myself and others because I was tall. They just assumed I was eligible. Uh, I would have to take a 98-pound bag of rice or sugar or flour and stack them to the ceiling of this warehouse in town. We would lay the first foundation for it. Every, every uh, bag of whatever would be put here until it covers the whole floor. And then we'll use that, each bag, as a step. And then we'll do another and then another step. So that toward the end, I would have a 98 pounds on my shoulder walking up these steps to the ceiling. I hit a, a bad spot wherein I couldn't find a job, another job. And <clears throat> my father became concerned. He thought that I was going to uh, get involved. Well, I had a friend. His name was Yorick Roll, very close, my very best friend at that time. And we were like that. We used to buy raw peanuts. If we had a couple of pennies, we would buy raw peanuts, we would roast them, put them in little teeny bags, and go to stand in front of the theater and sell them to people going in. But we were doing that just to make enough money to for us to buy a ticket ourselves and go in and see the movies. Anyway, <clears throat> he was without me one day. We were that close all the time. And for reasons I don't know. But he, on that day, I was not with him. And he stole a bicycle. And he was caught. And he was sent to reform school for four years. And that worried my dad. 
and because he knew I was very close with this guy. And he knew his own life was in the process of deterioration. He was in his 50s, I would think, and the wear and tear of all his ex experiences with farming had weakened his back. And finding jobs were difficult. So he is not a young man anymore. Anyway, he began to be concerned about me. I was leaving the house one day, and he stopped me. He was sitting at the door of this house that we lived in. And as I stepped out of the door on my way out, I looked at him and he looked at me. And he said to me, he said, he felt my arm. And he said, You've not been eating regularly, have you, son? And I said to him, oh, I'm okay. I'm fine. I said, I'm fine. I knew the weight that brought that out of him. Anyway, <clears throat> my oldest brother had stowed away on a motorboat that ran between the Bahamas, between Nassau and Florida. And he was the oldest of the, the boys. And my dad, oh, he had stowed away, and he, he went to Florida, and he got away with it. And he found a job, and he worked very hard, tremendous guy this guy was. Searle was his name. He met a girl, fell in love with her, and she with him, and they got married. And he went down to the police station in the center of Miami, and he told them that he was a stowaway and that he has been here such and such a time. And he explained to them what he did, that he works, he, and he has always worked, and he gave them the name of the employers and all that. And he said he wanted them to know that. And he said, I have a children, I have children. Anyway, they allowed him to stay. I don't know what the circumstances were, but they allowed him to stay. I was the delivery boy. I worked for a place called Burdine's Department Store. And I, my job, my brother worked there, and uh, he, he, I got the job through him. And I, um, uh, I uh, yes, I hated Florida. I hated Florida. I hated Miami. I didn't know Florida. I suspect that I would have hated Florida if I had traveled about in Florida because Miami was no different from the rest of Florida. But I did hate it. I hated it because it was a, an unfair place. I was told to deliver a package on, to Miami Beach. This is from Miami itself. And you go across the causeway, or you just walk across, or you take the bicycle. They had a bicycle that you, for the delivery boys. And they gave me the address, and they, they explained to me how to get there. And I went, and I, I found it, and I went to the place. I saw the address, and I matched it with the thing they had written for me. And I went up to the door, and I either knocked or pushed the button, and uh, a lady came to the door, a white lady, uh, 
And she said, yes. And I said, ma'am, uh, this is your package. I come from Burdine's department store. And she said, she looked at me in the most amazing way. And she said, get around to the back. And I didn't understand. I really didn't understand it. Because she's standing right there. She obviously is the mistress of the house. And I'm standing within three feet of her. And this is a big house. And I said to myself, why do I have to take it around the back? It's a small package. Were it something that too weighty for her, I certainly I'll carry it a mile if that's the case. But I wasn't aware of the depth of racism. I had been experiencing it every day there. But the impact of it in such a coarse way uh, she slammed the door in my face. And I took the package and I sat it right down on the step in front of the house. And I left. I go back to, to uh, Burdine's department store and I did whatever uh, uh, my duties were. And I went when a day was done. I went to Liberty City, which is where I lived. My brother lived there. I was living with him. And I had a few pennies, and I decided to go to a movie. So, and I went to a movie, and I sat, sat there and watched the movie. And at the end of the movie, now I'm going home to my brother's house. And I approach the house, and there's no, there are no lights on. Well, I jiggle the lock. I mean, the, the, the door knob. It's nothing. And then the door suddenly opens, and it's my sister-in-law, my brother's wife. And she grabs me and pulls me into the house, slams the door, and on the floor she's lying with her children. And she pulls me down, and uh, she said, what did you do today? I said, what did I do? What do you mean? She explained to me that the clan had come to the, to the house looking for me because I had misbehaved, I guess. I wasn't as frightened as one might assume. If I knew that the Klan would be there, I would have been, if not frightened, I would have been at least on my guard. Well, I didn't know. <clears throat> but at that age, now mind you, I am, I am 15 going on, going on 16 now. This is just after I'm in Miami, just a few months. I went to Miami from Nassau, and I went to Nassau from Cat Island. And between Cat Island and Nassau, my perception of myself had already taken hold. So I was not, I didn't spend the first 15 years of my life cringing in the presence of white people. The overwhelming, and we'll get to this as well, the overwhelming majority of people in the Bahamas were black people. So <clears throat> I grew up those 15 years, with the exception of the three months when I was a baby in Florida, I spent them in Cat Island and Nassau. And spending them in Cat Island and Nassau, I was within the circumference of the black community constantly. So that I saw people, 
how they behaved with each other. I saw respect for each other. I saw laughter. I saw an embrace. I saw it was an environment that nurtured me in ways that I wasn't even aware of, so that I got to 15, not afraid of white people. But that strong sense of self-worth came in, came in the Bahamas itself, out of my family, out of the families I knew, out of the, the society, such as it was, semi-primitive, as it in fact was. But they treated each other respectfully. They raised their children to be respectful of elders. If, if my mother was unable to work in the fields, her friends would come by and bring food. I mean, it was a wonderful community. So that when we got to Nassau, Nassau was somewhat different, but still, we have in Nassau, had in Nassau at that time, 90% of the people in Nassau were black. The cops were black. All the policemen were black, except possibly the head of the police department and his lieutenants. Mind you, I'm talking about a colonial country. But because it is a colonial country, and luckily for us, the colonial country being Great Britain, they could not, they could not manage a colonial empire because there were so few people. The British were very few. Do you know that it is, literally speaking, a very small number of Britons ruled India? Right. Hmm? They ruled most of the Caribbean. And they could not, there was no way for them to cultivate the necessary uh, personnel they would need to administer to their colonial possessions. So what they had to do, they had to educate the local people so that there were policemen, all of the policemen, with the exception of the few guys who ran the police force, were black. So as a kid, I didn't run around being fearful that I was going to be mistreated. Okay, that gives you an idea of what I came out of and the values I came out of the Bahamas with when I went to Miami. So that when I, went, when I walked into the police station, me, to get permission to go across the street, which was a vital statistics department of the government, I was going over there to get a birth certificate because I had misplaced my birth certificate, which I had gotten from the embassy, the U.S. embassy in the Bahamas. And I walked into the police station and I said to the gentleman, that the, I said, uh, sir, and I called everybody sir because my father taught me that, and my mom, pow, 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 you say sir to your elders. Anyway, and I was respectful. I walked into the... Um, of the police station, to get permission to go across the street, and so and so. And he called me the N-word, the guy in the thing, and he, and he said, take off that hat. And I was wearing a cap. <laughs> I looked at this guy sitting up on, 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 on the kind of a thing at the desk, and I said, what'd you call me? Mind you, I'm a kid. I'm 15 years old. I said, and I just lost it. I just said, I am Reggie Poit. That's my father's name. That's my dad. And his name is Reginald. And my mother's name is so-and-so. And they named me Sidney. That's my name. Well, the cops, there were several in the place. And they looked at me. As if I was insane. <laughs> oh, God. Now, had I been born and raised in Florida, I would have a different approach. Exactly. I would have been cultivated to respond in a different way, especially 
if I had spent those first 15 years of my life in Florida. I went to New York. I got to New York by hopping freight trains and all kinds of different interesting ways. Uh, I wound up in Georgia. I didn't get to New York. I wound up in Georgia in the mountains working as a dishwasher in a summer resort. Uh, I spent much of that summer, same year, all within the same year. And when I was done there, I had saved $38, 30, $39. Uh, and uh, I came down from the mountains, bus station, because that's how I got to the mountains. I, I went, took a bus from Florida where the job was offered to me because whatever. I, I accepted the job as a dishwasher in Georgia. They gave me a bus ticket and I went to Atlanta. They transferred me to another bus that went to another place close to the foot of the mountains and someone met me there and took me up the mountains. Uh, <clears throat> and I spent my, my time washing dishes there and I saved all of my money. I never took it down. And uh, when I left there, I had $39. By the time I got to New York, someone had rifled my little bag and taken my money and I, I got into New York with very, very few dollars in my pocket. New York was an experience. It was a staggering experience. It was massive. It was huge. There were incredibly tall buildings. It was. And I got there in the afternoon and uh, the place I wanted to go to was Harlem, to see Harlem. I'd heard a great deal about Harlem. Um, and I, I, I asked a chap uh, at the at the doorway of the bus station, I said, how do I get to Harlem? I had a very little small bag with a couple of three pairs of pants, some shirt, and that's about the size of it. Maybe one jacket, but not for winter. We'll get to that. So <clears throat> I, uh, he said, well, you go right down those steps and you, uh, you just go, go to 116th Street. And I said, okay. So I go down the steps, and I said, uh, what do I do when I got down there? And I watched people. They would come, and they would put something in a little thing for the turnstile. And a guy upstairs had said to me, uh, then you take the train. And I said to myself, wait a minute. Train under the ground? That doesn't make any sense. And it certainly didn't make any sense to me. A train under the ground? But anyway, I went through the ritual, and I hear this rumbling, and it scared me. And along comes this train, and I saw people putting a nickel, it was those days it was a nickel or something, in, and they go through the turnstile. Well, I was always courageous in a way, some ways. And I, and I go through the turnstile. And I got, as he told me, 116th Street. So I got onto the train, and every time it stopped, I would, but I was, Amazed, how could it be running under the ground? Makes no sense to me. But I'm alert and I'm sitting there and I see the station comes up, 116th Street, and I jumped off and I walked and followed people going up the steps and I walked out at 116th Street and 8th Avenue and I was in Harlem. I did learn early that everything I want to do in life requires that I accumulate understanding, knowledge, know-how. Uh, what, what is the quickest, most dimensional way to make that kind of accumulation? You have to read. You have to read. Uh, I've always felt that I, I didn't know so much, and yet everything pretty much that I didn't know is available somewhere. 
And I, the first place I, w I went to was to newspapers. I had an experience with a Jewish waiter. I was a dishwasher. And he was a waiter in Queens, New York. And I used to buy the local newspapers, in, in sometimes the Journal American, sometimes the New York Times, Daily News. At the end of the evening, when the waiters are done and the place is closed, just about closing, the waiters would sit at a table and they would have uh, tea, coffee, a, a late snack, which was permissible by the owner. I would sit in the dining room next door to the kitchen. And I would sit there because everything else is done and all the dishes are done except those that the, the waiters are using for their snacks, you see. So I sit there. And I'm reading one of the papers, and there was a Jewish waiter sitting at the table, elderly man, and he saw me there. He got up and he walked over, and he stood by the table that's next to the kitchen, and he said, hi. And I looked up and I said, hi. He said, what's new in the papers? And I said to him, I can't tell you what's new in the papers because I don't read very well. I didn't have very much of an education, so I can't tell you what's He said, ah, he said, well, uh, would you like me to read with you? And I accepted. I said, sure, I would like that. Every night after that, he would come over and sit with me. And he will teach me about what a karma is and why it exists what periods are, what colons are, what dashes are. He would teach me that there are syllables and how to differentiate them in a single word and consequently learn how to pronounce them. Every night. One of my great regrets in life is that uh, I went on to be a very successful actor. And one day, I tried to find him, but it was too late. And I, I regret that I never had the opportunity to, to really thank him, you know. I hit the age of 15 not being afraid. I was on my own in New York City at the age of 15. I was respectful to people. I said, as my father explained to me, to elders you say, sir, if it is a man. To elders you say, ma'am, if it is a woman. You respect older people. I learned from him a certain way of behavior. But what I learned is, was not in terms of uh, something I got out of a book. What I learned was an internal connectedness to life in the family, in the small community where we lived, how people treated each other, particularly how my father treated his friends and my mother you see. So I came at 15 to Miami, Florida, with a sense of that humanity. That is why I am sitting in this chair now. All of what I feel about life 
I had to find a way in my work to be faithful to it, to be respectful of it. I couldn't and still can't play a scene. I cannot play a scene that I don't find the, the texture of humanity in the material. I can't. I don't know how fine uh, an actor or director I, I am or have been, but every person who goes into a theater, and, I, and, I, and, and, and anyone who watches this uh, video who is interested in theater, or the creative arts. Anyone interested in, 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 in theater arts, they enter a movie house or they enter a theater with a stage. They sit there with other people. It's a darkened room Their attention is on what's going on up there. They have five senses that are the tools they bring into the theater. They know, feel, touch. They know what they see objectively. They know what they hear. So their five senses are working. And they have been working pretty much since they were tots. So everything that happens on that stage, everything that happens on that screen, they can pass a judgment subconsciously as to whether we are hitting the marks or not. Because there isn't a person that sits in a movie house of any maturity who hasn't been disappointed, who hasn't been uh, exhilarated, who hasn't felt fear, who hasn't felt joy, every one of the emotions that human beings experience, even the most terrifying ones, they have been akin to all of them at one time or another, in the, either in their daily lives, their weekly lives, their monthly lives, their yearly lives. So that when they sit in that theater, they are, that's all they bring in. That's the scoreboard they bring in. And they sit there and they watch actors playing at fear, embarrassment, uh, at love, at hate, at all of the emotions in life. That's what they bring in. So when they sit there and they're looking at actors doing that, they cotton to those actors that makes that connection, makes that connection with them. And that's the actor's job. That's, it's not their job. All they do is they bring this panel of human emotions with them. And these emotions are in neutral. They are absolutely in neutral as they sit there. And one by one, the, the, this really fine actress or actor begins to do things that somewhere in the consciousness of the, that audience, they're saying, oh boy, I, yeah, I know about that. I've seen that. Wow. That's where the admiration comes from. Because they can also tell when that actor or that actress is not reaching home. I was overjoyed for obvious reasons. It is, it was an evening that I never thought would come in my lifetime. I'm glad it did because I could use that as a peg around which I can articulate my appreciation of my country. That he became the man that he is as a result of his experiences 
in this culture of ours. He was an unknown young student with a point of view, with an integrity, with a vision, with an understanding far deeper and far wider than his objective imagery would imply. Objective meaning his color, he is a young man, perceives himself to be African American, he is, however articulate he might be, he is not only articulate. He, however visionary he might be, he is not only articulate and visionary. You can go down the line, and he kept expressing that, showing that to us, not intentionally, but we just couldn't help but see it. We saw it. And if you take him back to a time when he was not quite as revered as he is now, and you looked at him then and say that this guy could be president in five years. You wouldn't get one bet on that, you know? But he, but he has shown us that our survival is totally dependent on us perceiving ourselves as a single family. We are six billion five hundred million in our family. We have one home. It's a planet. It's a planet that has not grown one single inch since its creation. What is there is what we have, and that is our home. It will be our home until we either self-destruct or until nature decides that it wants or she wishes to alter it. Until then, it is entirely up to us to effectuate our survival in humane ways. We have to find a way to articulate the carrying capacity of our home. We don't have a clue as to how many of us can be accommodated on this piece of earth. We really don't. There aren't but so much uh, resources to sustain us. If we are 6 billion, 500 million now, before you know it, we're going to be 13 billion. What we need is men and women who can think on our behalf in the period of their existence. He is an example. He has tried to surround himself with people who are like-minded and who will tend to and nurture the place we call home, who will attend to and nurture different cultures. We, uh, we will protect different faiths, provided, of course, there is a mutual understanding that the principle has always got to be us as a family. It is not very good that we have really not made a, a stronger, sustained effort to speak to our children, the black ones, the white ones, the brown ones, about this man, this man, it is because of this man, Lincoln. 
Lincoln, that we have a President Obama because the values of Abraham Lincoln were ignited in President Obama. And President Obama ignited some of Lincoln's values in his fellow Americans. And if you were to take a listing of the American population two years, four years, five years ago, the possibility of him being what he is today wouldn't have crossed very many minds. Would not. As a result, here is a guy who says, I am this, and I am Im imperfect, but I, yes, and I screwed up here, and I did this there, and I'll tell you about it. And if you can tell me where I can improve, I will listen to you. My responsibility is to represent you. Well, I find him absolutely glorious, this guy. Tremendous integrity. Great, great humanity. And, and uh, I wish him well. I wish him well. I think the world, I don't know the extent to which it will happen, but I think the world will be the better for him having come this way.